But while we're on the topic, um, the illusions are real too. They're real illusions. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, sure. You know, my current name for my theory of consciousness is illusionism. I don't and think a lot a of good people. Name. A lot of people hate that. Maybe hate you it. do. I do. Well, but I'll <laughs> tell you. Let me let me defend it. Let me defend it. Think of your telephone, your smartphone. Think of the user illusion on its face. That's real. You're not the victim of it. You're the beneficiary. You don't want to know all the billions of details behind the scenes that make those apps do what they do. That's what illusionism is. Consciousness, what you and I and Robinson have, all the rest of the people paying attention to this, is we have an extremely limited, somewhat metaphorical, and uh, extremely useful, manipulable, valuable, helpful amount of knowledge about what's going on inside us. We don't know what's going on in our brains except via this illusion. Now, when one of my favorite quotes from John Searle, because I always like to, I don't like to shoot straw men. I like to get real people who say things that are wrong. But I, <laughs> now I have a proper target. And he says at one point, remember, always insist on the first person point of view. Uh, and I think that's the worst, single worst bit of advice anybody working on consciousness has ever offered. Because if you insist on the first person point of view, you never get to ask the hard questions about how the heck it works. Because from the first person point of view, we're clueless. You don't know how your thoughts come to you. You don't, right now, you don't know what processes are churning in the background that are vying for which words you're going to speak next. Thank goodness you don't. You have a, you're the user of your own brain and you are able to use your brain as well as you do because of this wonderful user illusion, which is consciousness. Well, we have to make sure that people realize this doesn't mean that there's a little homunculus in there looking at all the show. Right? Because um, the homunculus is part of the user illusion, too. Uh, uh, you, you don't need the screen. You don't need the theater. You just need the oversimplification and occasional distortion of the information that you have about what you're doing in your own in your own thinking. That's why I call it illusionism. Do you are we are we to take it that you think that consciousness is an illusion, or just that something like qualia are illusions? Well, qualia are the properties that philosophers insist consciousness has, and I say no. There's there's no place for those quality for those properties because the properties that do the work have to be functional properties. They have to be the properties that get you to act, to prefer, to lament, to jump, to cry. To, to And qualia, by philosophical tradition, aren't those kind of properties. They're intrinsic properties. You don't need any intrinsic properties. Those, those aren't real at all. Qualia just aren't real. But consciousness is perfectly real. It's just not composed of quality. Yeah. But is it an illusion, consciousness? Yeah, so just to, to clarify on my end is what, so Dan, what's illusory is 
just the idea that the first person view of what's going on in the brain is all or really what's happening inside our skulls. But that is just a simplified model of what's happening yeah, in our yeah, skulls. Right. And my and, guess about what you think, Sean, is that you don't like the connotation of the name illusionism that I want, I want to Dan to illusion. tell me whether he thinks consciousness is an illusion. All right. I will address that question <laughs> completely directly. Consciousness is the name of a whole variety of phenomena that extend down to amoebas and trees and sponges and dogs and cats and robots and the idea that there is one phenomenon which is you know, the light is on or off. Either you're conscious, you're a zombie, or you aren't. That's one of the worst ideas that is currently fashionable. That idea of consciousness as a supercalifragilisticexpialidocious property that divides the universe in two, that's an illusion. Consciousness is real. It just isn't what you think it is. So I'm I'm going to maintain my position that believing consciousness is real and calling your stance illusionism about consciousness is asking for trouble. <laughs> yeah, there's well, got to be a better name. <laughs> well, well, let's let's talk about that because it, um. Uh, <laughs> I've um, noticed I, t I say the same thing about free will. Sure. It's real, but it isn't what you think it is. And I agree. And no, you see, philosophers like to uh, inflate things. This philosophical inflation, or they want to go for the absolute. And so they, they think consciousness divides the universe in two, what it's like to be something and everything else. Or they want free will. Either you've got absolute free will, even God couldn't tell whether Eve would bite the apple, <laughs> uh, or, or free will is, is an illusion. Those are just bad philosophical ideas, and they're bad for the same reason. They're bad because they have not learned the Darwinian lesson, and that is that anything interesting has gradual edges. There, there's, uh, there's no sharp line between the things that are alive and the things that aren't. There's no sharp line between the things that are conscious and the things that aren't. There's no sharp line between the things that have free will and the things that are. That doesn't mean that there isn't free will. I, I love David Sanford's argument about mammals. He says, if you take it as essential that every mammal has a mammal for a mother, then there aren't any mammals. Because there'd have to be an infinity of them, which there aren't. What gives? Now, to my amazement, some philosophers go hunting for the prime mammal, in effect. There has to be one mammal, the, only, the first mammal, the only mammal that didn't have a mammal for a mother. And they think that unless that's true, there aren't any mammals at all. You and I know better. This is just the Sorites paradox. But the same thing is true of free will. The libertarians think, unless there's this moment when an absolutely uh, quantum, undetermined choice happens, then you're not responsible for anything that flows thereafter. Nonsense. Free will is, a, is an accomplishment, not a metaphysical gift. 
Some of us have free will. We grew into it. And the same thing is true of consciousness. We grew into consciousness, and we can grow out of it gradually. So since the so many people view this as just repugnant, they really don't like the idea that consciousness is, comes in degrees or the free will comes in degrees. Mostly, I think they've abandoned vitalism. They're happy to agree <laughs> that there's no sharp line between what's living and what isn't. <laughs> look at, look at, biologists know what life is. They don't bother trying to define it. Some because of them that's, do. I mean, some of them do. <laughs> well, some do, but, but, but you know, that's a sort of scholastic enterprise of, of no real importance. And the same thing is true. Philosophers should stop trying to define consciousness, you know, find the essence of consciousness. Essentialism is a bad idea. We've known that ever since Darwin. And, and so I, I think it's important to stress that the very common assumption, even self-congratulatory assumption of people, that they know what consciousness is, and by God, it's not an illusion. I want to... I want... I want to rub their their noses in the mess that they make with that with that idea because I think it's wrong, and they just refuse even to consider that it's wrong. They just they they won't. They say no, no. I blocked my ears. I'm not going to hear that. Well, give it a try. You'd be amazed. <laughs> 